Welcome to session 10 of data communication. Today we'll be looking at packet switching. Now, packet switching principles. Now, circuit switching are designed for voice. Resources are dedicated to a particular call. Now, as the circuit switching network be began to be used increasingly for data communication, there were two, short uh, sh two shortcomings that became apparent. Now, much of the time, a data communication is idle, then data rates is fixed or was fixed. Now, both ends must operate at the same rate. These were the two shortcomings with regards to the circuit switching. Hence, we have the packet switching network. Now, with the packet switching network, we want to look at the basic operations. Here, data transmitted are in small packets, typically 1,000 octets. You know, an octet takes, takes 8 bits. Now, longer messages are splitted into series of packets. Each packet contains a portion of user data plus some control information. Now, these control information take note of the routing addresses, so the source IP, the destination IP, or the source MAC with the des destination MAC, and a whole lot, flags, and all that. Packets are received, they are stored briefly in buffers, and they are passed on to the next node. So it uses the principle of store and forward. And this is typically found in our routers or a routing device. So we have a typical packet switching network. We have a dedicated PC connected to it. So if packet is moving from say PC A to PC B, this is the application data. The blue color indicates the control information or the packet header. And this whole chunk is broken down into one, two, three. This whole packet goes through the switching network, goes through some nodes if there are, and comes out in this format. And all these are put together to give us the original data that was transferred or that was transmitted. What are the advantages? We have line efficiency. Now, single node to node link can be shared by many packets over time. Now, packets are also queued and transmitted as fast as possible with the use of the buffers. Now, data rate conversion. Each station connects to the local node at its own speed. So, nodes buffer, buffer data if required to equalize rates. Here also, packets are accepted even when network is busy. So you realize that we prefer the packet switching network than the circuit switching network. And here the delivery may be slow. That's the only downside with packet switching. Priorities also can be used. One will look at the switching techniques. Now stations break long messages into packets, as we've, so we've seen earlier on. Packets are sent one at a time to the network, and packets on the network are handled in two ways. We have the datagram and the virtual circuit. Let's take a look at the datagrams. Here, each packet is treated independently. There is no reference to packets that have or that have gone before. No. Each packet, like I've shown you here, each packet is treated differently. And once you break the main packet into chunks of packets, we treat each of these separately. Now, packets can take any practical routes, and packets may arrive out of order. Some may also go missing. And in some datagram network, it is up to the receiver to reorder packets and recover missing packets. So we have a, an example of a datagram approach. We realize that we have this chunk of packet, or we have this packet wanting to transmit or trans move from this PC to the server. Now, this is the switching network made up of various nodes. Now, this packet can take practically any path to the server. But you realize that we've broken down the packet into three, one, two, three. 
Now look at B. B, once the packet moves from this and passes through this node, packet 3 still keeps on to this distance, whilst packets 2 and 3 make use of this link. Then, whilst packet 3 is going on this road, we have packet 2 taking this route and packet 1 taking the other route. Now, this continues and packet 3 uses that route to this point, to the last node. Packet 1 and 2 gets to meet at the same link and joins packet 3. Now, finally, we see that there has been reordering of the packet. The fact that 3 arrived first doesn't mean that 3 is going to start the node. The arrangement is still going to be the same. So, we started from here and we've gotten this far. Now let's look at the virtual circuit approach. Here we have a pre-planned route that is established before any packet is being sent. The call request and call accept packet establishment is done. This is what we are calling the handshake. So station A sends a request to station B that it needs to send data through it. Station B responds and say, yes, I'm ready, send the packet, or no, I'm busy, and rejects the packet. So once that is done, anytime packet A, station A wants to send data to station B, it uses that link. Each packet contains a virtual circuit identifier instead of the destination address, and no routing decision is required for each packet. The clear request to drop circuit is also there. Here, there's no dedicated path. In the datagram approach, there is a dedicated path. Here, we have a pre-planned route. So let's look at the packet switching, but this time with the virtual circuit approach. So we have, still using the same diagram, we have the packets being broken down into one, two, three. Now, because there's a dedicated path, which is being represented by the short dashes, Despite packet 1, 2, 3 gets to break up at a point, they still follow the same path to the destination. So you realize that they move, they are separated here, but they still move on one single path. And this is the pre-planned route. It means that this route has already been established through the handshake. So once the packet is being transmitted, they know they are going to go through this link. Now, in our traditional telephone setup, one of the devices that is being used is the S25. And this is an ITU-T standard, which was formed in 1976. ITU-T is a steady group, just like we have the IEEE's. And this specifies interface between the host and the packet switch network. Almost universal on packet switch network and packet switching is the ISDN. Its functionalities are defined in three layers, which we are going to look at. We have the physical, we have the link, and we have the packets. Now, with the physical, the interface between the attached station and the link node is established. So we have a physical connection between the attached station and the link to the node. Now, data terminal equipment are used. I will show you how the data terminal or the te data terminal equipment looks like. Then we have the data circuit terminating equipment, which is the DCE node. Then we have the physical layer specification. It uses the X.21 for its physical layer specification. So these are the physical components of the X25. You need a DTE, you need a DCE for the nodes, but you need a DTE for the user equipment. And we need an interface. It can be, be a gigabit port, it can be an Ethernet port. And for the physical layer, it uses the S.21 specification. Now let's look at the link. The link level standard is referred to as the 
Link Access Protocol Balance, or LAPB. And this is a subset of the high definition link control. It provides reliable transfer across physical link and helps to transmit data as a sequence of frames. Then we look at the packet level. This packet level provides a virtual circuit service. And its logical connection is known as a virtual circuit. These are set up. And these can be called external virtual circuits. This is an example of the S25 making use of the circuit switching. So we realize that the short dashes are the virtual circuit. So we have a virtual circuit connection to C from A. But this is a dedicated line from A to the switching network. So these are the physical link. So we have a physical link here. We have a physical link here. We have a physical link here. So A, B, C, D, E, F have a physical link to the packet switching network. But there's a virtual link that goes to the main frame that's from A to C, then from also B to C, then B to D, and F to D, then the last one from E to D. Now, what is the relationship between the levels? Now, the user data passes to the X25 level 3. Now, X25 appends control information, and this we've already seen that they can be header files, they identifies virtual circuits, and provides sequence numbers for flow and error control. The S25 packets are passed down to the LAPB entity, and the LAPB entity appends further control information. So we have the LAPB frame. Of course, there's a header and a trailer. Then this is the level 3 header, the X25 packet, and this is the user data. So the user data, when it comes to the X25 packet, we attach a layer 3 header to it. Then once we attach a layer 3 header to it, we put in the LAPB, which is our link access protocol balance. So we attach that to the, both the user data and the layer 3 header. And this brings us to the end of this session. I'll see us in the next session.